it's a great honor to be here at the Grand Sons and Daniel Conference. At my head, very, very big rank of this is the Grand Sons, and the only one I remember was when I was about 16. I got the Grand Sons seminar, and he found out that I was new, and he asked me some questions, most of which I wasn't able to answer. And um, one of them was to find what was the integral of e to the minus x square from zero to infinity. I didn't know the answer, and the other was something about whether which alternating groups are simple, and that I was able to answer. And um, so in retrospect, uh, really his questions, I mean, exactly find my sort of abilities to do combinatorics and algebra rather than analysis. And of course, today is going to be um, more about algebra. And uh, the title is Scarification. Roots of unity, and let me first talk about clarification in general. And the, uh, the, the terminology goes um, to the work of Louis Crane and Igor Frankel around 1994, who introduced um, the, this notion. They gave examples, and um, the sort of the, the big question, the big problem in the paper um, was to um, they had no the formal arguments, there should be a lifting of. Um, theory of Rich Dickens derived with invariance of three manifolds to the next level, to the invariance of four manifolds, um, and that um, quantum group, in particular, Lustig's um, idempotent form of quantum SL2, the root of unity, should lift to the next level to uh, some sort of a category, two category. Um, and and so, so we still don't know um, a good clarification of uh, Witten Stichen drive invariance of three manifolds. We have various clarifications of Schrittichen drive invariance of links, so there's a lot of work in this direction. Um, and uh, we have a little bit, a little bit of information, um, indications that there does exist a uh, sort of legitimate clarification of um, Lustig's quantum group at the root of unity. Uh, and I'll, I'll get to this closer to the end. So clarification um, can be exemplified by the following chart. So we can start with numbers. Um, and um, on some base level, at the next level we see a diagram where we have vector spaces or maybe three abelian groups with a bunch of operators, a linear maps acting on them. Perhaps operators form some interesting algebra. And at the next level we have an abelian or a triangulated category. Um, you can go from, an, from this categories to vector space or abelian groups by taking k null, the Grofin D group. If you want to get to vector space, you tensor k null with some field. Here, we have action of exact functors. Yes. And um, between exact functors, we can study, we can study compositions of these functors and study natural transformations. Transformations between compositions of these functors. So to go from the richest uh, level of structure to the middle level, we take the Grofin D group. When we do this, exact functors become linear maps. Exact function induces a map on K null. It's a linear map. Um, to go from this structure, a vector sp space with a bunch of operators, uh, to numbers, we just take the dimensional vector space. When we take the dimension, we forget about there is no information about operators. It's all erased. Uh, in the same way as we go from the top uh, level to the middle level, uh, we lose all information about natural transformations. They, they don't, they are invisible at the, at the level below. Um, so, and this is an example of what is called clarification. So numbers, vector spaces, category of vector spaces, clarify, clarify the, clarifies um, the semi-ring of natural numbers. If you take a vector space, you can take its dimension, that's a number, multiplication of uh, numbers corresponds to tensor product of vector spaces. Uh, addition corresponds to direct sum. If you want to, if you want to find the analog of subtraction n minus m, then you're forced into homological algebra. You're forced to work with complexes of vector spaces rather than a single space. And then, um, so instead of n, you just have a complex V, whose order characteristic is n, a complex W, whose order characteristic is m. And then, to come up with analog of n minus m. 
you would uh, choose a map of complexes and then pass to the cone, perhaps shifted by one to get the cone of the map, to get the complex with only characteristic n minus m. So um, finding the unlock of addition of subtraction on the next level already forces you from vector spaces into complexes, into homological algebra. It's still not known what's the unlock of division. Division. So if you try to divide a number by a number, n by m, 2 over 5, what should be the unlock at the next level? Um, and the way to think of it is there, there are no examples of monoidal, so this is a fancy way to phrase the problem, there are no examples of monoidal triangular categories whose growth and decrease is Q or something which has enough division. So I'll just mention this as a side, but probably very hard, maybe hard problem. Problem, categorify, categorify. Q, ring Q, so construct a monoidal category C, which is triangulated, related monoidal, sorry, probably my handwriting might be very hard to read, I'm guessing, because it's very small, so my apologies. I don't know if there is some way to scale up. Triangulated monoidal, monoidal category. Um, so, so can you find one whose growth and decrease is Q or something or perhaps a subring of Q such as Z with a joint one over N for some N. So, so I don't know, I think it's a great question. Um, so this is already, we got to the frontiers of modern science, I think, in five minutes. Um, now let's go back to what's known. Right, so, right, so if you take the category of final vector spaces over a field, its k group is z. So you can think of manual category of vector spaces as the clarification of the ring of integers. On the second level, vector spaces. Yeah. After right? Yeah, yeah, right. So, so what are examples here? So, so if you look, for instance, if you look at the development of representation theory, a geometric representation theory, then, um, so if you if you if you if you if look at the work of um, on localization work of many people localization around the late 1970s or the 1980s that nowadays we can phrase this work as saying well pe people discovered that there exists a verification of the Hecke algebra using shifts on flag varieties and um, so that generators of the Hecke algebra act by functors between shifts on these varieties you can take composition factors and so on so the big upshot of this work. Um, so, um, so many people involved are in, in, in the audience um, was that, um, I mean, the, the big application was people discovered, people found territorial formulas for determining multiplicities of simple modules and size standard modules in category O. But nowadays you can think of this as on, on, this, on this level of clarification saying that we had, we were at the middle level, we were, we had Hecke algebra, we had generators, um, it's separators, and uh, Hecke algebra became K null of some monoidal category right here. So nowadays, perhaps the most clean uh, version of this category is the category of Zogit bimodules. The category of Zogit bimodules, it, its growth and decreeing is, is exactly H, so that it has, um, it's a very nice category. It has a diagrammatical de description. Um, uh, so I'll, category of Zogit bimodules graph group is H. So um, in this, it's um, depending on how, what, what kind of structure you want to see, you can look at the additive category, triangular category. It has exact functors corresponding to generators of um, the Hecke algebra. Uh, when you take compositions of these functors and form direct sums of these compositions, you get the uh, cardinal linguistic basis, one of the cardinal linguistic basis in the Hecke algebra. But you can also study natural transformations between products of these functors. And you get a very interesting diagrammatical structure. Um, the point is that whenever you have a monoidal category, you can think of it, uh, some, often you can think of it geometrically uh, in terms of generators and relations. If you have a monoidal category, generator would be a morphism between tensor product of some objects of the category to a tensor product of some objects of the category. And you can visualize this, you can visualize um, this object by drawing, say, some kind of a, a blob on the plane with incoming legs for, say, this would be a morphism from x1 tensor x2 um, from this object to this object, y. But you can, you can set up, um, there are sort of, uh, you can put any number of 
edge, incoming and outgoing edges, and many monolog categories, interesting ones, additive ones, um, have such descriptions where generators are given by these diagrams. Relations are given by saying, well, I fix some number of endpoints here and here and label these objects. I build, I build a web, a planar web of, um, of pictures out of my generators, and then I impose some relations with certain combination, linear combination of pictures with uh, coefficients on my base ring of field, uh, uh, where things, where various things in the middle, but you fix the objects at the end point. So the picture, that certain linear combination is zero. So in some, I won't emphasize, of course the subject deserves, deserves its own lecture, but for now I just want to emphasize that monoidal categories, categories can be thought as informally as two-dimensional algebraic objects. For instance, in this sense that relations in generators are two-dimensional. Yeah, yeah. So, so we're describing a monoidal category, additive monoidal category, by saying, uh, so I have some generators generating objects, so their labels. I have generating one morphisms. Uh, a morphism could be, for instance, I could put a blob like this, saying this is a generating morphism from object X, from object X to object Y, but it could be more complicated. It could be a morphism generating morphism from tensor product of objects to a tensor product of objects, and then I pose relations. And relations take the form of saying that the linear combination of pictures is zero. And all the pictures in the relation, they have the same set of objects at the bottom and at the top. But in the middle, you have different combinations of blobs. And so that's an important point. So when the categories are like, they have this natural two dimensional flavor in the same sense as the source rings. The source rings are one dimensional. Because in associative rings, when you're describing it by relations and generators, generators are elements. So when you, your relations are certain sum, certain linear combination of products of elements is zero. So you, you in a sense, writing these elements on a line in a, row, in a sequence. So in this sense, associative rings are one-dimensional. Um, these are two-dimensional. So if you take the, assuming that um, you have some extra conditions on the category so that you're able to form the graph in the group, when you pass to the graph in the group of, of monoidal category, you get an associative ring. So, so clarification, taking graph in the group, brings you one dimension down, and this uh, sort of point goes back to Eager's and Lewis's work in 94. Um, so, and I think this is sort of important to understand. Um, this is slightly informal, but makes sense. Yeah, if you ask about zero dimensional objects, I'm not sure, but I would, my would guess would be that cumulative rings are like zero dimensional objects because have generators, but you can permute them any way you want. So in some sense, it's zero dimensional. There is no underlying line. You can just move things around. So here I would, um, I'm less convinced, but here I would say community things. Complexity goes up a lot every time you go one dimension up here. So here you build topology, algebraic geometry out of community things. So there's enormous value. Here, uh, I mean, pe 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 people build some version of community geometries, but it's hard. It's, Incomplete, it's sort of it's not clear, and this is even harder. So any any new example here is computationally more sophisticated, usually and difficult than what you see on this level or what you see on this level. So the complexity goes up a lot, but also you get structural depth and beauty. It's, it's all together. Um, Uh, so, but out of Hecke algebras, you can pull, out of Hecke algebras, you can pull invariants of links. So Hecke algebra contain, contains the braid group, there's a map from the braid group to the Hecke algebra. You can take the trace, the Kniano trace, you get various invariants of braids and links. And th these are examples of witten rishitikhin derived link invariants. Invariants, which can be pulled out of from Hecke algebra. Algebra, and they can also be recovered from uh, quantum groups. And uh, so, so, so as we understood gradually over the past 15 years or so, that there's the next level of structure where, um, uh, so here we have a Zogin category. Here we have clarification of quantum groups. Of quantum groups. And in the middle we have link homology. 
So these are homological invariants of links. They are often bigraded. So to a link, you assign to a link L in R3, you assign bigraded homology groups. And if you take the Ovi characteristics of these groups, H, H, L, L. So if you take the Ovi characteristic of this homology, which is the sum minus one to the I Q to the J rank H, I, J, then you recover uh, Rishitikin to Rife link invariants. So I'll, um, I'm going to give one of the simplest examples here for verification of quantum groups. Um, but of course, so structure, of course, it's uh, very complicated. Uh, so, so quantum groups um, uh, are, in particular, very Hopf algebras, algebras um, of, a, of a special form, as you know from pioneering work of Vladimir Ginfeld. Uh, and um, so what, what would be a clarification of half algebra? And in fact, I can only give you examples uh, where I skip the antipodes. So I really want to give you examples of clarification of bi-algebras. So if I get the antipode, we look at bi-algebras and their clarifications. And uh, so perhaps the simplest example of clarification of bi-algebras is representation theory of a symmetric group. So if, you, if I take the symmetric group SN, so let us take the group algebra. The field is not too important. Let me use complex numbers. Take the group algebra, let me call it A sub N. And to any, to any algebra or ring A, I can assign its growth in D group, K null of A, which is the growth in D group of finitely generated generated projective modules. So it's symbols um, to any, for any projective module P, finally generated over A, we form its symbol, bracket P, um, and the group has the symbols of generators, and whenever P is isomorphic to direct sum of two projective modules, we impose the relation that the symbol of P is the sum of the symbols of P prime and P double prime. And for arbitrary ring, this is, K null is just an abidin group, essentially. That's it. But sometimes it's much more. So here's an example where it's much more. Um, so first of all, when I take the group algebra over C of any finite group, it's semi-simple. Simple. So any module is projective. So here we're looking at the category of all finitely generated modules. Then the group K null for N is free group on symbols, generators of symbols of simple modules L lambda, where lambdas are partitions. So maybe I'll use part of this board. So we have inclusions and Inclusions of symmetric groups, which induce inclusions of algebras, and which give us factors of induction restriction, induction restriction factors between categories of A and tensor M modules and categories of A and plus M modules. So, um, of course, these factors take projectives to projectives because everything is projective. So, we can look at the induced maps. Just maps, symbol of int, symbol of res on growth in the group, on k null. And so what we're going to do is form the big k null, which is the direct sum of k null of ring A sub n over all n non-negative. And we'll get maps from k null tensor k null into k null um, given by um, all given by the symbol of the induction factor and the summing over all n and m. And likewise, you have the map in the other way, symbol of the restriction factor from canal to canal to the canal. So the key, uh, so you can check immediately that induction, the induction map is associative, the restriction map is co-associative, And 
and uh, moreover, you can check that uh, in fact, k null is a bialgebra. With this map being multiplication, and this map I'll put capital M, and this map being co-multiplication, so that delta of x y is delta of x delta of y. So co-multiplication is an algebra map, and so th this follows this lifts to a certain statement about um, about composition of induction restriction factors, and essentially it reduces to the Maquis formula for the induction restriction. Restriction Maquis. formula for inclusions of symmetric groups. So this formula exactly matches uh, this property of this axiom of the bialgebra, um, but on, on, on the level of on the level of functors, on the level of induction restriction. And uh, so can, in fact, can all can be identified with the half algebra, half algebra of symmetric functions. functions. So can all have a morphic to sim of symmetric functions and instantly many variables. Uh, if you want to add the antipode, the antipode corresponds to taking a module, then tensoring it with a sign representation and multiplying by minus one to the n. So these are all classical structures and representation theory phrased in this um, uniform um, com compact way. Uh, so, so what we want is clarification of, um, of course this is a very large half algebra, but we want the clarifications of half algebras um, which are smaller in size in fact, but they, they are more subtle. So for instance, it might not be co-commutative or commutative, so clarifications of quantum groups. So let me give you the simplest um, possible example of such clarification, and I'm really going to restrict to SL2 because SL2 is the simplest, is the simplest simple Lie algebra. And I'll, 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 and we'll only clarify um, the positive half of um, SL2. So we we'll take USL2. There's also the quantum version, maybe, and we're going to take just the plus. So um, we only take the generator, one generator E, the positive generator. Um, if you if you're working with quantum groups, then delta E is E tensor one plus K tensor E. But there's a way to hide K. There is a you can hide K. Hide K, defining delta of E is E tensor one plus one tensor E. But moving this K, which acts by powers of Q, into uh, into somewhere else, into the um, introducing a some fairly simple but modified braiding um, on our vector spaces. Uh, and uh, so this is, so the result is so-called maybe twisted by algebra. And I refer to you, I refer you to a book by Lustig on quantum groups where this is done. So this, um, this positive half of quantum SL2 has just, just one generator E, but it has an integral structure. You can take powers of E, E to the N, but you also want to include divided powers, which is e to the n over n factorial. And in the quantum case, you put quantum n factorial. There are many reasons why you want to have this divided powers. For instance, if you want to be able to exponentiate e, um, then, then exponentiate e, you take sum of e to the n over n factorial, so you want this present. So over the central version, let me call it u plus. Let me, let me go back here for a second and point out that there is, when you're taking the union of the symmetric groups as n, and there are group algebras, you can think of the entire system as a monoidal category, because you can say, well, I have one object, I have an object E, um, and my category has also objects which are tens of powers of E, because it's monoidal, and the harms are the following, harm from E tens are n, into E tensor M is either zero if N is not equal to M or they are a N, the group algebra with symmetric group AN, if N is equal to M. Uh, so we get, and because we can put symmetric groups next to each other uh, to have this inclusion, we get a monoidal structure. It's not a very exciting monoidal category, but it is a simple example. 
and um, and because I, I was telling you about the relation of um, monoidal categories to planar diagrams, uh, I let us draw the, the resulting diagrammatical description of the of this category. Um, so we have a single object E. So this picture is identity map from E to E. So this picture is the map from E square to E square, which is just the permutation transposition element of the symmetric group S2. And then the relations are, this is identity, this. And because we are in the planar world, we can, we can move past each other the faraway crossings because they happen in different faraway locations of the plane. So we have this just from the categorical axioms. We don't need to add this as a, as an, as a, as a, as a relation. Uh, so, so what we're going to do now is m slightly modify this graphical calculus. So it will construct a different monolithic category. Um, uh, it's going to have a single generating object E, E tensor M. This will hold, but we have a different algebra here. So the relations are going to be that we allow a dot on a strand, um, far away dots, and we also introduce crossings. Far away dots and crossings are set to compute. We also introduce these relations. When we slide a dot through a crossing, we add identity map. Likewise, for sliding a dot from bottom left to upper right. And we also add these relations. This is zero. This is equal to this, and I think that's everything. Uh, so we get, we get uh, a family of rings. Let me call them NHN, where N is the number of strands. So, so if you want to understand the size of an HN, the point is that you can move all the crossings, all the dots up above the crossings. And you can simplify the crossings using some version of the, of the relations in the symmetric group, modular low order terms. So this is not identity, but zero. But whenever you have two crossings on the same, same spot next to each other, it simplifies to zero. As a result, you can, you, can, you can simplify any element to linear combination of elements, which is just a diagram of the permutation and dots above the permutation. Uh, but this algebra has a more, less pictorial, more conceptual description. Um, and HN is the um, BGG or the majeure, majeure divided difference algebra, divided difference. It's BGG because it's square equal to zero. Okay. Okay. What else should I remove? Any names from there? Yeah, also another in the Hecke algebra. Algebra. Um, so how does it appear? We start with the ring of polynomials and n variables, x1, xn, and also think of it as a module over itself. Uh, we look at the divided difference operator, d sub i takes a function f and set it to f minus fi. fi means we transpose xi with xi plus 1 and divide by xi minus xi plus 1. In particular, if you do it once, you get a symmetric function in xi, xi plus 1. If you do it twice, you get 0. That's why Vanya um, mentioned this relation, which is pictorially this. di is the crossing, di squared is 0. So di pictorially is the crossing of the i and i plus first strand. And uh, we also add to this endomorphism algebra multiplication by xi's. Multiplication by xi is denoted by a dot on the i strand. Um, and uh, so the, the easy result is that NHN can also be described in this way. So NHN is endomorphisms, endomorphisms of the, of Paul N uh, uh, viewed as a, in fact, it's all endomorphisms. If you view Paul N as a module over the subalgebra of symmetric functions in N variables. 
it's a, uh, is a result. And uh, because Paul N is a free module of Frank and factorial over the subring of symmetric functions, you see that an HN is the matrix algebra of size N factorial with coefficients in sim N. Uh, and so these divide separators appeared in the work of Bernstein and von Gelfand um, when they studied the static cohomology of the flag variety and, um, and certain actions on this cohomology ring. And you can recover this picture, the smallish break picture, if you work with equivalent cohomology of the flag variety. You can recover it. So, so, what we, so we, we now using these rings and HN as our baby monoidal category. So what happens if you let me call this an H, the corresponding monolith category. Category and we claim, we claim that the growth and decaying of an H, of an H is exactly our positive half of quantum SL2 with this integral structure, where we can divide by n factorial. And this is because, this is because um, NHN is the matrix algebra of size n factorial. Now, when we're taking this object E, um, its symbol will correspond to the generator E of the, of the quantum SL2. The symbol of E tensor N will correspond to the nth tensor power of generator E. But um, this, also, this is also the symbol of the free module NHN, projective module of NHN. But this free module is the sum of n factorial copies of the, um, of the column module because it's a matrix algebra. Um, so as a result, this is n factorial times the symbol of the column module. You can also think of it as the symbol of the polynomial module. Because of this, the symbol of Paul N, it corresponds to the uh, divided, divided power um, element e to the n of NHN. And then induction, we can do induction restriction for this algebra because we can take these pictures with n strands, m strands, and put them together. We get inclusions. NHN tensor NHM into NH N plus M. Induction restriction functors will give us multiplication and multiplication on, on, on U plus. And um, to recover parameter Q, we keep track of the grading. So we make NHN graded with degree of a dot. Dot can be thought of the Chern class, for Chern class of some line bundle. Degree of a dot is two. Degree of the crossing is minus two. Uh, so, so in this clarification business, multiplication by Q, and Q is this mysterious parameter, sometimes coming from physics, from chern simon theory. So this mysterious parameter uh, becomes something very down to earth after clarification. It becomes, it often becomes a grading shift in um, when you work with modules over some ring. Or if you work it on the algebraic geometry side, it becomes an action of C star. Sister action. Sorry, how much time do I have? So, so, so. So, so, so most of the, if you look at the literature on clarification, at the examples of clarified structures, most of the time this Q, uh, this quantum Q, um, is a formal parameter. So we're clarifying structures of generic Q. So the big mystery is what happens at, um, when Q is a root of unity. So that means that Q, Q is a root of unity, Q to the n is, is one, and, and there is not much work here, so I'll tell you about what's known. Um, so the idea was, uh, before we worked with, say, the ring ZQ over the ring ZQQ Q inverse, and this ring is the growth index ring K null of the category of graded vector spaces. So that the grading shift corresponds to multiplication by Q. So this is just the category of finding the dimensional graded vector spaces over a field. Uh, but now we want to add um, conditional Q to the n is one. So the most naive way is to look with is to work with 
um, cyclically graded spaces. But if you think about it, what we want is not this relation, but uh, something more refined, because Q is a complex number, as you can see, and for the unity, we really want the relation at the end, second atomic polynomial, uh, at Q is zero. So for instance, when N is prime, what we want is the relation that one plus Q plus Q squared plus all the way up to Q to the P minus one equals zero. This is psi P of Q. So we want this relation which is um, much more refined. Refined. So how can we, how can we achieve this? Um, and uh, so here are the, um, and um, essentially the only examples we know, um, so what we want is to produce, um, realize, say from this, let's just, I'm only gonna do the case when n is prime, so n is p, so we want to realize zq modulo the ideal one plus q, plus q to the p minus one, we want to realize this growth in the group of some category, growth in the group of c, growth in the ring of c where c is monoidal, monoidal and triangulated. And so interesting, so the answer really comes from um, very old work of Mayer, as in Mayer Vietaris, and then more recent, but also around mid 90s, work of Michael Kapranov, uh, re related work of Sarkaria and Du Bois Violet. Um, and uh, so, so here's the idea. We're going to work, okay, so the first point is that um, if you have a, if you have a half algebra H, half algebra, then um, its category, its category representation is monoidal. So the category of H modules is monoidal. We can tensor representations, M tensor N, so that the growth in the group of H is in fact a ring because of the tensor product. Uh, so the, the second point is that well, there are so-called stable categories. Um, so, and then most interesting when you have a ring A which is Frobenius. Frobenius uh, has some sort of duality, for instance, which ensures that projective modules are the same as injective modules over A. And um, for the Frobenius algebra, in fact, for any algebra, you can form the stable category of modules. Category of modules. And uh, um, it's, it's the same objects as just the category of modules, but new morphisms, different morphisms. You say that homes in a stable category, uh, the old homes of A modules, modulo those that factor, modulo, modulo morphisms which factor through a projective module. So anything which factors through a projective module or through a free module doesn't matter is zero. So we're modifying morphisms only as what we usually do in category theory. Uh, so the, so the interesting fact is that the resulting category, stable category, stable category is triangulated. When A is Frobenius algebra, with the shift functor given by taking an object M, putting it inside the projective module, which you can do because projectives are the same as injectives for Frobenius algebra, and then passing to, um, then defining the shift of M to be P mod M. So it, and it turns out to be triangulated. Uh, another nice fact is that a finite dimensional half algebra is Frobenius. So if you have a half algebra and it's finite dimensional, it's Frobenius. So if you look, if you take a fine dimensional half algebra, look at the stable category, it's triangulated monoidal. So the, the tensor product descends to the stable category because if you tensor projective module over half algebra with any module, the tensor product is projective. Um, so as a result, K null of a stable category null is a ring. And in this ring, the symbol of the free module, of any free module is zero because of our definition. Um, now let, let's see what it means. So of course we want to avoid the semi-simple case because in the semi-simple case, every object is projective, the whole thing is zero. 
not interesting. Um, so let's take, in some sense, the, the most elementary, non semi simple half algebra. Let's take H to be K um, of generator Y. And I'm going to assume that K has characteristic P. So we take polynomials on Y module of the ideal Y to the P. Then this is a half algebra with, if Y is primitive, delta Y is Y tensor 1 plus 1 tensor Y. Primitive because then Y to the P is primitive, so it's a half ideal. Let us make this graded by saying that the degree of Y is 1. Then um, the free module H is 0 in the Groff and Ring of the stable category. Uh, but the, the free module, in fact, is built out of P copies of the trivial module of the one dimensional module. P copies of trivial representation. Trivial representation, let me just write it as K underlined on which Y acts by zero. And, uh, but P copies with grading shifts because multiplication by Y shifts the grading up by one. Uh, so this, the symbol of the trivial representation is the unit element of the growth and ring. So the symbol of H is, well, essentially P times one, but really we need to take into account grading shifts. So it's one plus Q plus Q square plus all the way to Q to the P minus one, minus one. And so, so this element is zero in, the, in, in this, in this growth and ring. So the conclusion is that K null of the stable category of H modules for this particular H is Z. Z of Q, because we have a trivial module and we have its grading shifts. So that gives us Z of Q, Q inverse, modulo the ideal, this one, which is the p stack atomic polynomial. So, so this is an example, very nice example, where, um, where we did get the ground ring we wanted. We got this uh, cycle atomic, the ring of cycle atomic integers in the PF cycle atomic field uh, as the growth and ring of a monoidal chunk of the category. And um, so what now, but what we want to build up, we want to, this ring should only, uh, should be the ground object, but we want to have many, many categories we can work with above, above this category. So what we want is to have a large supply of, of monoidal categories over this base category. So, so what, are, what are examples? So let me slightly change notations and I call this, gonna call this YD from now on. So if you take, if you take an algebra A over characteristic P field K graded algebra, algebra, assume it comes with a, with a differentiation of a certain type. So D is a map of degree one from A to A, such that D of AB is D of AB plus ADB, and such that D to the P is zero. So this is a, 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 a modification of the notion of a DG algebra. In a DG algebra, you have a graded algebra with differential D with this map. There's also sine here minus one to the degree of A, and D to the D square is zero. So we're changing this D square is zero to D to the P is zero. And uh, sort of as I mentioned before, this goes back to um, Meyer, who was looking for a version of homology theory without minus signs, where you take the boundary of a simplex, you don't add minus signs, you just take everything coefficient one. But this forces you into characteristic P and it gives you the relation D to the P is zero. Uh, so, so, so later, I think Spanier, Spanier showed that homologically you don't get new information in, in this example. But then um, my, Michael Capranov wrote a paper in mid nineties about um, what would be the analog of this in characteristic zero and not for P, and there have been subsequent work by other people. Um, so, but I'll only talk about this characteristic P case and in, in this framework. Uh, so the idea is that you can do, so what, what you're really doing, so we're going to look at the category of modules over A with an action of D. You can write the, uh, sort of the, the definition easily. We can look at the category of AD modules. It's going to be an abelian category. The point is that there's an analog of the notion of homotopy. So we can pass to the homotopy category. 
category. In the somatopic category, you'll, you'll be mapping back not by step one, but by step p minus one, because now d to the p is zero. And then, and, and you can pass to the derived category here. When you're passing to the derived category, you so you'll have an action of A, an action of D, which are compatible. You and you define the notion of quasi isomorphism to be a map such that if you forget the action of A, you just have the action of D. So you have a map between two modules over algebra H, um, and it's a map. And think of it as a map of a stable category. So you in, you invert it if it's an isomorphism in a stable category. So there are, um, so there is a supply of Categories we can work with obtained in this way. Take a, what we call a PDG algebra. And I should mention that this, what I'm talking about is a joint work with Chiyo. Um, so there are certain analog of homological algebra that we like to refer to as the homological algebra. So it's, it's a modification, so generation of homological algebra, but now instead of complexes, and you can think of complexes, we have this equal to zero. So complexes, I mean this D, differential in homological algebra, you can think of it as um, coming from the action of the exterior algebra in one generator, which is a half algebra in the category of super spaces. So, uh, so this, um, is instead of super spaces, we work in characteristic P, and now we have d to the p zero. So we also have a half algebra in the background, but slightly different. Different. You can, you can, you can try other half algebras. The benefit of this particular half algebra is that you get the right answer for the growth in for the stable category, for the stable category, and also you can classify in decomposable objects. So it's sufficient, and not, it's not too complicated in a certain sense. Um, and we call it homological algebra because instead of just complexes, this exterior algebra in one generator, we are working with other half algebras you're using stable category, and then we're building module categories all of this, all this category, and we're doing this procedure which is very similar to what we do in homological algebra. So I think the name is appropriate. Yeah, yes. So you can you can pass to the, well, you can pass to the derived category um, as in the usual. So every so, so large chunks. Yeah, you can move things around. Yeah, you can, yeah, you, yeah you, can, you can easily, yeah, you can easily build roofs, yes. Roofs, yes. So, so, so let me let me show you. So the problem, I mean, for I think for many years, the the issue with uh, trying to do this p-complexes was that there are no there are no examples where you get something non-trivial out of this. But let me show you how to get how to recover uh, the defining relation in the small quantum cell two and the defining relation is that e to the p is zero. Like we're working with quantum cell two at the p float of unity. We have this property e to the p is zero. So what's the meaning of this um, on, on on the next level? Well, so first of all, we want to take our um, BGG and Hecke algebra and HN and add a, add a derivation to it of this form. So how to do this? So we want to, HN, we want to add D. And HN is endomorphisms over CMN of certain, of certain space, certain module pole N. So what we're going to do is to first define a derivation here on pole N and then induce the derivation of the endomorphisms in the usual way. Uh, so on Polen, we're thinking about Polen if it is a free, uh, so, uh, so I'm, I'm being slightly informal, I'm using two notations for the same thing. I'm mean, thinking of Polen as free uh, rank one, rank one module over the ring of polynomials, K, X1, Xn. So we first define a derivation on this ring, D, by simply requiring that d of x to the i is xi squared. And in our pictures, because xi is given by a dot, the derivation, differentiation takes this dot to two dots. Now, when we're extending this derivation, and d to the p is zero for obvious, for simple reasons, when we're extending this derivation from polynomials to a module over polyn, from algebra to a module, 
um, because the module is rank one three. We just need to say how derivation acts on the generator of this module. Let me call the generator one on the line. So d of one, so it should be some linear, linear function of axis because it should have certain degree. So it's a one x one plus a two x two plus a n x n. And because we want everything to have pictorial description, our derivation, our action must be local in the sense that action on this crossing, action of the derivation on this crossing should look the same as the action on the derivation on the crossing shifted by one or two. And you see what this, this implies is that the consecutive difference must be the same. So AI plus one minus the simple computation shows you that to, for the action to be local in the pictorial sense for the action of D here. Local, we need the differences to be the same, same number A, and number A must lie in the, in the field FP if we want D to the P to be zero. So there are very, very few choices, and you can check what the, you get the best case if you assume that this difference is one or minus one. For some reason, so you can take, at the end, we can take D one to be just X one plus two X two plus N X N. And with this, you can compute the action of D. So D, as we mentioned before, on a single dot is two dots, and D of a crossing. And the crossing, again, the crossing is the, is the BGG divided difference operator. Given by that formula, the action of a derivation on the crossing is uh, minus a crossing with a dot here, minus crossing with a dot here, which you can modify to identity minus twice uh, dot here. But these are just examples of formulas. Um, really, uh, for now, and uh, you can check with this, this assumption, um, NHN, in fact, so what happens is that you can, if you, if you look at Paul N as a module over this ring of symmetric functions, Sim N, it's free of rank and factorial, and you can take the the standard basis given by certain monomials in x1, xn, up to certain powers, so the standard basis for this. So you can write Paul N as sim N times some standard vector space of dimension factorial Wn. And the way I chose D is such that the, the action of D preserves the subspace, takes the subspace to, to itself, and uh, it preserves sim N. As a result, when you look at the... Sorry? D of one. Um, okay, so, so so here I'm just talking. Okay, okay, okay. So, so yeah, yeah. So 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 let me just. I mean, so so this is for the action on the algebra. This is for the action on the module. But but sort of really the upshot is that for the action on the module, um, the module is preserved by D, and you can check that n is equal to p. The module is contractible because you, you'll, you'll have a term. You'll have a term which is a free module. Uh, of length p. Because of this, uh, you get this module contractible, contractible, uh, free over, over h. And then when you pass to the endomorphism algebra, it also becomes contractible when n is equal to p. So the conclusion is that nhn HN is acyclic in the topological sense. It's acyclic, it's zero object in the stable category. Cyclic in h mod. And then as a result, um, its derived category is trivial in the topological sense. And in particular, the object, the object corresponding to the corresponding to EP, uh, uh, which is our object E tensor P. But now again, in the topological sense, the subject becomes zero. So it's zero in our derived category. As a result, when you pass to the Groff and ring, you get the uh, you get the property that um, on the symbol of e to the p, which is e to the p, is zero, and this is the defining relation for uh, positive in the positive half of small quantum SL2. And so this is the interpretation of this relation on the categorical level in terms of uh, this topological algebra of over this particular truncated polynomial algebra H. And uh, so, so th there are some other examples which show that you're on the right track. You can you can extend the action of D, you can make D acts on certain rings which categorify positive halves of simple least quantum groups. There is also an extension, uh, the action uh, written by Chiyo and my other former student, uh, Ben Elias, the action of, um, 
of, of IH on the entire, um, on the purification of the whole quantum SL2, not just the positive part. Uh, so there are many indications that we're on the right track, but there are lots and lots of technical, um, basic technical questions. So it's, I feel like it's going to be a long story, um, but it's, it's very nice because it, there are sort of many new twists here, well, especially the hopological one, um, but there are also sort of clear, clear, um, clear incompleteness because we are forced into characteristic P, so we, we can only try to do the case when the order of the root of unity is um, prime or maybe power of prime at most. So there are all, all these questions about how to get rid of the prime condition, how to pass to characteristic zero, to characteristic P, probably at the cost of something much more, something getting, working with something bigger. Um, and, um, and there's also this problem of, uh, if you look at Rishtik and Reif invariance, with Rishtik and Reif invariance of three manifolds, you're not only forced into uh, rules of unity, q to the n is one, but you also, um, in general, need to divide by n. So what you really, I really want to clarify is q with added n fruit of unity, over n, but also one over n, uh, q but z. So perhaps you can merge this problem that I mentioned at the beginning, clarification of Q with clarification of roots of unity, but I, mean, I don't know, so it's, it, it looks tricky. So, but I want to go back and point out that there's a very basic problem, which is clarify Q or some version of Q, or some subring of Q, which is maybe Z, one over N. Um, I'm gonna stop here. You get different rings, but I think the ultimately the, the big issues, one of the first questions is how do you clarify, how do you categorify these rings? How no, no but there are also fine type invariants. For fine type invariants, we, I don't think there are good, there are not really good clarifications for fine type invariants. It's something else. It's something else. So if P equals 2, yeah. you basically construct supermodulatics in characteristic 2, where there is no sign root. That's right. Well, yeah, just the usual homological algebra, but only in characteristic 2. Uh, so you know there is a way to lift this over z, yes, which will be just the usual. Is it the, the only way? Is there okay. uh, other ways? Oh, okay. okay, I'm not sure if this is exactly your question, but maybe it relates to some. So, so there is, for instance, there is an odd in characteristic. I mean, for instance, there is an odd version of the story where you use the ring of x1 xn where x i x j anti commute. So there is analog of BGG operators in that ring. And so you can you can go for a while and you can extend, you can get a clarification. You, so you, you, you modify it, so you don't divide directly your kind of here. You just write down what di is inductively. Uh, no, I would probably I'll probably mess up minus signs if I do it, but you can you can we can look it up in, in the archive. But so there's an odd version of this story for this anti-commute. Um, but the, it's not super version because um, they anti-commute, but their squares are not zero. But you, you can get analogs of di, analogs of Nienhecke algebra. Um, you can get analog, the entire analog of the clarified quantum SL2. But now the grammatics is odd, so things, far away things. Are, no, no, this um, the little piece, there are sort of a spread out through the literature. The odd version, for instance, you, you can look at my paper with Alex Ellis and Aaron Loud, but then there is also a very recent paper of Loud and you know, So it's spread out through the literature. I'm happy to give you references later on. Uh, yes, so, so you can define in the um, yeah, sort of the, the sort of things that I understand somewhat sort of have a little bit of knowledge is uh, clarifications of say U plus um, for various G using KLR rings. So it's very diagrammatic. You can, um, in the simplest case, simplest case, so there is a natural definition of this derivation D on KLR rings and conjecture, hopefully it gives you the right small 
positive half of small homogons, but it's a conjecture. Um, um, the issue with non-simple list case, non-simple list case, um, is that in non-simple list case, in this rings, in this classification of homogroup, uh, diff lines, uh, dots on lines of diff with different labels, uh, we'll have different degrees. So one could have degree four, one the other degree two. So if our derivation D has fixed degree, then we cannot define it on, on, on dots of lines of different kinds connected by a, by a, by a thick edge. So this is what the, the basic obstacle to extending to non simple case. Okay. In some way, informally, they're grammatically based on some version of a symmetric group, and the property of the cosets of a symmetric group, Sn times Sm into Sn plus M, into the splitting of the cosets of a symmetric group for inclusion of symmetric group. So you take, you take, so you take Sn cross Sm into Sn plus M, and then you restrict to Sk cross Sn plus M minus K. So pictorially, you go from N strands and M strands into N plus M strands, and then you split into K and plus M minus K. Um, so this is induction then restriction. But by, um, in this particular case, we can use the uh, Mikey formula to decompose this into the sum of you first restrict from N and M to, um, to some R, N minus R, and so on. And then, then you permute here, and then you induct. So this is equal to the sum, direct sum of this over R, where R is a thickness here. So there. I don't know if anybody has happened to write what is the concept of a category with monoidal structure and homonoidal structure together. Um, so, so what you say should be is an example of that. Yeah, right. so, 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 yeah, so all the examples they have this flavor, flavor in some sense based size-wise, they're based on the symmetric group. It's this lines with some decorations with some relational, but in, in some in conceptual sense, it's based on the family of symmetric groups. So it's, it's not clear how to write this down axiomatically or what is there some natural generalization. Right, right, but so, so I mean, back then, there was, for instance, there were some yeah, back at the times, many people, you know, thought, I mean, after his work, people started to his work, people started to think about qualification, but often in the semi-simple case, and my simple cases somehow it doesn't give you enough structure on, on this level, so, I mean, I simply, yeah, yeah. You can, I think you can, uh, <coughs> I think so, some, so, so, I think if you, especially if you ignore the antipode, you can, you can do a little bit, but I mean, not a whole lot, but maybe it's better to ask here. Here. What if that might be SN plus M to SK plus SN plus M minus K? Sorry? What if that might be SN plus M to, no, there. SN plus M to plus. Yes. This is an inclusion. No, that's, yeah. what if that might um, No, this is sort of my way to point out that there is a restriction factor. This is, sort of, uh, this is a shortcut for the restriction factor from modules over here to modules over here. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just a sort of a fast way to save it as a restriction factor. Okay. Okay, so thanks